Good morning, and welcome to this daily devotional for August 30th, 2022. We are continuing our study through the life of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Today we're going to be seeing Jesus heal a man who is blind. His disciples are going to have some hard questions about why this man has been suffering and whose sin it is because. If you had judgmental people in your life or if you struggle with being judgmental, today will be especially impactful. All right, folks, let's begin with a, with a time of confession and prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up our sins and our failings to you now. Lord, we confess our sins to you and you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you give us the, the wisdom and the insight to hear what you have to say to us this morning in your word. Help us to walk in the way that you direct us. Help us to, to purge any judgmentalism out of ourselves. And Lord, help us not to... Uh, not to allow uh, the churches and the and the people around us to be judgmental. Though we uh, pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name, Amen. All right, ready to go to uh, back to high school or uh, some other judgmental place you can imagine. John chapter nine, starting in verse one. As he, speaking of Jesus, was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. So in this passage, we, we see this this conversation about why someone would be suffering from birth, even. You know, was this his parents' fault? Was this because of some sin that he would commit later? That's some, that's some tough questions. If you've ever been suffering and uh, you've asked yourself the question, why is God doing this to me? What have I done? Maybe someone else has done something. And that's why you're suffering. Or if you've had loved ones or friends ask the question and they're suffering, why am I suffering? Jesus is going to speak to that. In verses 1 and 2, there's the question. Why do some suffer illnesses or accidents or, or just don't seem to have as good of a life as other people? First application we should see here, because Jesus is going to say, no, it wasn't this man's sin. It wasn't this man's f uh, parents who sinned. We should believe that there are universal consequences for sin, right? Through one man's sin, death entered the world. That's what we hear about Adam. Adam and Eve both sinned. But it is Adam's sin that is pointed out as uh, the uh, what caused sin, uh, death to enter the world. But here's the simple fact is that um, it is now appointed unto mankind once to die, and then comes the judgment, as it says. We will each face death unless uh, unless we are alive when Jesus returns and we are caught up in the clouds with him 
But generally speaking, it is appointed to us to die. You may be forgiven of your sin. You may um, have confessed all of your sin as, as we just uh, began this Bible study with, right? And he, he forgives you. Does that mean that you shouldn't die anymore? The problem is, is that you can be forgiven of sin yet still have to suffer the consequences. Um, there may not be punishment for sin, but still consequences, right? Um, a child who steals from a store and is arrested by police, um, when they get home, their parents can forgive them, but they may still have to do community service uh, for, the, for the magistrate, right? Uh, there may still be charges that are pressed by the government, uh, the consequences of their uh, theft. So there's consequences, and then there are uh, then there's punishment, right? And uh, we we like the idea, at least at first, of you sin, you get X. You know, if you do this, then this will happen. And a strong correlation between what you do wrong and what will happen, but. If you've lived it all on this planet, you know plenty of people who did something wrong and they got away with it. Or maybe even someone else got punished for that person's sin or their mistakes. If, you're, uh, if you have siblings, um, this has inevitably happened where your sibling did something and you are the one who got in trouble. Um, this happened to me a, a fair bit. Um, but <laughs> Hi, Mark. <laughs> um, this, this all points to the fact that, that God intentionally detaches the consequences and the punishments of our sin from the acts of sin themselves. And, and, and that, here's a little bit of speculation from me. I believe that the reason why he does that is so that we will have the freedom. If he connected it completely connected to each other, where if you sin, you just immediately get the consequences, like 100% of the time, um, then then we really would be uh, not really free, right? Um, the question is, is, do we want to sin? Will we risk consequences? Um, if we were just, if it was just a mathematical equation, you do X and you get Y, then, then it really wouldn't be as true of an illusion, it wouldn't be as true freedom, right? So that's my speculation on why, but but we do see that even in the Proverbs, like everything is kind of generalized. It's like, well, generally speaking, if you do this, this is what will happen. But not like always, because like there's sometimes where like you do like people who live wickedly and foolishly, they, they somehow land on top, right? And we can all like, turn on the TV or, or look at social media and find people very quickly who are living immoral, godless, evil lives and foolishly, and yet somehow they're making bazillions of dollars and they seem to have it all together. And then we know people who are very righteous and, and good, and yet they seem to be very much suffering um, uh, tragic things have happened to them. But just because there isn't that direct correlation between sin and consequences doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. And oftentimes we've seen this where one person sins and it affects, the consequences hit everyone around them. Other people have done things and you have suffered for them, haven't you? Other people have made choices. Um they've hurt you. It was their sin that has hurt you. So we should believe that, that there are universal consequences for sin, such as death, disease, suffering. Just because someone gets sick doesn't mean they sinned, like, in order to cause that. Of course they've sinned, and they're part of a whole society that sins. We all have many failings, and it's not when you see someone who is born um, 
with Down syndrome, it's not because their parents sinned. It's not because they're going to sin or they've already sinned. Um, that's the consequence collectively of all of our sin. We should see people who, who have those afflictions and see our own sin in that, that we are part of that. We've messed up this world. And all of the suffering in the world is collectively our responsibility. Second point of application on that is, you know, we should be very careful about trying to tie specific suffering to specific failings. In this case, Jesus says there isn't one. Okay? He very clearly says, at least in this case, there isn't a sin that is the cause of this. Not his parents, not him, not his neighbor, not someone who was walking past the house when, when he was given, you know, born or something like that. Um, and we're not to be judges. We're going to get a little more into that, but, but we're not called to be judges. We're called to be evangelists. We've been called to be saints. We've been called to be uh, servants of God, but we're not called to be judges. We're not there to suss out who did what and who deserves what. Because here's the thing. Jesus already told us what everyone deserves. Everyone deserves to go to hell and be punished for their sin. You, me, everyone. But we have been given the good news that in Jesus Christ, people can be forgiven of their sin. And be brought back into a relationship with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That's our job, right? Verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. So here, the, this person's suffering was for the purpose of revealing Jesus's, uh, Jesus to the world. By giving Jesus an opportunity to heal him, um, Someone born blind. You can look through the whole Old Testament if you want, but nobody who was born blind has ever been healed in Scripture. Jesus is the first one to do it. So this, this isn't just a generalized, um, oh, he did another miracle, just like Elijah or just like Moses or something like that. No, this is unique. Nobody's done this before. Okay? Um, so... Right there, it, it sets Jesus apart. Um, and that's part of the reason why it would seem that he had to be born blind from birth. Right? So, application here is, you know, we should seek what God is doing, not what the devil is. Right? A lot of people get really focused on what Satan's doing, what the demons are doing. Like, what are they up to? You know, maybe maybe there's like some some you know fortresses of power, high places, and in, in this neighborhood, we need to go around praying around the neighborhood to find these dark places of power so that we can pray against them. And we're not called to do that. Like, where are you getting that? That's not in here. What is in here is you need to follow God. When God sends you somewhere, when God calls you somewhere, when God uh, has things for you to do, to be faithful in, you need to do those things. You need to be focused on the work of God. We're moving the kingdom forward, okay? We're not playing defense here and wondering where the next demonic attack is going to come. We're not playing defense. We're playing offense. We're going out and destroying the strongholds. We're attacking the fortresses. Right? And that means we need to be concerned about what God is doing and what the kingdom of God is doing, not what the demonic forces out there are doing. We need to be delighting in mercy, not in judgment. We need to rejoice at people being saved, not rejoice at people being punished for their sin. We need to always seek the good and the blessing and the grace and mercy upon people, not seeking, oh, well, I was going to pray for this person, but it turns out that they're actually a really horrible person, so therefore I'm not going to pray for them because they actually deserve this bad thing that's happening to them. 
Seriously? Like, now, I haven't met a Christian that would actually say that out loud, but uh, um, a lot of people have thought it. You can tell by how they're wording things that they're thinking it, right? But uh, that's not where we're supposed to go. We have been forgiven so much. God's grace and mercy has been poured out on us. So how can we do you know expect anything less for other people? If God could forgive a sinner like me, he certainly can forgive and have mercy on this person here because they're not they're not half as bad as I am. That should be our attitude. And if you think that you're better than other people, um you need to spend some time with God. Seriously. Um, because you should know you better than anyone else, right? And at the heart of it, how much evil is in your heart. Every inclination of our heart, apart from God, is evil, selfish, self-serving. The closer you come to God's righteousness, the more you see how awful of a person you are. That's true for me. I, 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 I see that. Um, I, I, on the mission trip I was just on, uh, I just met such awesome selfless people and I just uh, constantly felt overwhelmed by just like, gosh, these people, you know, I was the youngest person in a room of like 90 some volunteers uh, at the uh, staging area for, for most of the, well, the first whole week and part of the second week. Um, but just I looked up to everyone and just saw, wow, <laughs> they, uh, they, they're a lot more righteous than I am. That's for sure. But we should be seeking what God's doing and seeking grace and seeking mercy, not seeking to pass judgment on people. Okay. Uh, verses 4 and 5 here. Uh, we have, We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Speaking of like when we die or when we go to heaven, right? There, We have a moment here on earth to accomplish the will of God. God has placed you and me here on this planet to reach people with the gospel, evangelism, um, disciple believers, disciple people, and to edify other believers, to build them up, right? So we must, we should be busy about salvation, discipleship, edifying believers, not on speculation about what's really going on. That's God's business, not yours. Let's just step out of it and do what he's told us to do, right? While it's still day, while we still have time to work, there's still salvation to be had for many people if we would go proclaim it. And we need to build up the believers so that they can do the work of the ministry. Uh, verses 6 and 7 here. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So he left and washed and came back seeing. Why is he spitting the mud? Why does he do this? I mean, if you want to crack open some commentaries, you'll get like 15 different opinions on why this and why that. I'll say this, though. Jesus never healed anyone else like this. This is unique. He, he never does it like this again. This is the only time he ever does this like this. Okay? So he heals him in a new way. And, and I'll pull off this application from that. We should never get so stuck in our traditions that we don't have any room for God's new work. How many times has God started a move in a new way and the old stodgy traditionalists couldn't handle God moving in a different way or using a different method or using a different kind of person? The Methodists were created because um, the mainline denominations couldn't stand the idea that, that these preachers were going out into fields and preaching the gospel in fields. They should be doing that in a building. The re Why are they in the fields? Because so many people were coming out to hear the gospel. They couldn't fit in a building, so they went out into the fields. But, of course, the traditionalists were like, nope, can't do that. You need to be in a building. Or else it's not real. And so the whole Methodist denomination started because 
The traditionalists could not handle people singing hymns because that's just revolutionary. And two, they were out in fields. So the Methodists created a new denomination uh, because of that. And you just see that repeated again and again and again. There's always something new that God's doing. And um, people stuck in their ways can't see it. So what is God doing today that maybe you look at and go, that can't be God. Where is God moving? And are we going to be open to it? We need to be. Because God has something new that he wants to do in your life. And he has something new he wants to do in your neighborhood. Something new that he wants to do. Um, and why does he want to keep doing new stuff? Because he doesn't want people saying, I got the method. You just need to do it like this. You need to do this, X, Y, and Z. And then poof, God's kingdom will be achieved. No, he wants you to have to be dependent upon him to move in power. You need to be dependent on him, not a method. That's why he does new stuff. All right? Um, so be looking for that. Walk closely with him and listen to his voice, not tradition, not... And that's not to say tradition is bad, but don't get stuck in tradition, right? Have good traditions that keep you walking in the right way, but don't use them as a fortress to, to say everything outside of this is not God's. You can say, I like to do it this way, this is our preferred way. This is the best way we've found, but we're open to new things as God reveals them. Let me pray a prayer of blessing over you and let you get out to the work that God has for you today. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless each person watching this video, that you bless them in their lives, that you bless them in their work, and that you give them peace and joy today in your spirit. Lord, I pray all these things in Jesus' powerful and mighty name. Amen. God bless you all. If you have time and want to check out some more Bible studies, there's a couple uh, playlists right up here. Um, you can work your way through those playlists um, uh, as they are both completed now. God bless you all. See you later.